church. Hey, you guys give it up for Aaron this morning. Uh, so excited to be here. As he was saying in the announcements, I wanted to give you one. I just kind of touch on one again for you just because the timing is, is right. Next Sunday night is our opening to Life Connect. Uh, we do that first month or first service or first Sunday of the month of Life Connect is in the evening. Uh, that enables me to be there with you and to uh, be able to speak with about the vision of the church, where we're going, what God is doing, how you can plug into that so that you have an understanding of, of who Real Life Church really is. As much as we love Sundays and we love Sundays, amen? amen. There is a whole lot more to what we do in not only our community, but here at the church through the week. And so there's opportunities to serve, and you can hear about those, but you're not obligated to anything. We just want you to come see who we are and what we're about to know that if you are ready to take that on-ramp into getting involved at Real Life Church, Life Connect is the way to do it. And so that kicks off next Sunday night uh, at 5 p.m., and uh, would love to have you there for that, or 6 p.m., I'm sorry, and uh, would love to have you there for that. Uh, we feed you. And then we talk about just, I get to tell the story of Real Life Church and how it started and, and where God is taking us and what He's doing in us. And so challenge you, if you get a chance to sign up for that, do so. As Aaron said, you can do that on the uh, QR code in your seat, or you can just stop at the Connect counter as you leave today. Get with one of the people there, and they will get you signed up for Life Connect for March. We'd love to have you plugged into that. Also from that, let me just say to those of you that have been serving at the Reed Center, thank you so, so much. Uh, for giving of your time and your abilities uh, to people that you don't know, but I will tell you are very, very grateful to have someplace warm to sleep. And so thank you for giving the shelter. It's an emergency shelter for those of you that don't know. Uh, it's not a full-time shelter. We only open up once the temperatures drop below 30 degrees or 32 degrees. And then we make sure that they have a warm place to take a shower and to sleep and to get some laundry done and do things like that. We've had people that don't have a home. They're in a homeless situation in there. We've also had people that uh, just didn't have power through the last cold snap or uh, the heat that they had wasn't sufficient and so they needed someplace warmer to be and uh, it has ranged in age anywhere from 19 years old to last week we had a gentleman that was there it was 82 and uh, such a great great opportunity to meet and to connect with some people so those of you that are serving in that capacity whether you're bringing food whether you're giving one of our five-hour shifts to monitor and just hang out there and be a body in the building uh, we say thank you so much for that and if you weren't aware that we were doing those kind of things at the reach center and you say man I want to know how I can get involved. We're pretty sure that the cold snap is, is going to be over by Tuesday morning. That's our hope for folks. Um, but uh, we don't know what March holds. I've been in Arkansas where it snowed on Easter. And uh, I rebuke that in Jesus' name. Uh, <laughs> But if you're interested in helping out or seeing what the REIT Center is all about, please stop by the Connect counter, talk with one of the people there, Ms. Jennifer Kirby, any of those when you see them, uh, they would love to give you some information about that. So we're kicking off a brand new series today called Unstrapped. And, and how many of you, let's just ask this question, how many of you at some point in your lifetime financially have felt strapped before? Yeah. How many of you married, let's talk to married people in the house. How many of you married couples have ever had a discussion on, on finances in your home with your spouse or significant other? Yeah, yeah. How many of you wouldn't call it a discussion? <laughs> no, there were apologies afterwards and all flowers. I, I don't know how it went for you, but uh, finances is an interesting topic because I think the church a lot of time hits it from the perspective of tithing. And that's really all they talk about. It's, it's one of the reasons I don't talk a lot about it here at Real Life Church, simply because the church has done a bad job of really taking some of the lessons that the Bible gives us about finances and teaching them. What, what it does is it will actually, most churches go, people got to tithe so we can keep the lights on. And, and that's really, really shallow and really, really not my heart at all. I, I want you to know that there's a reason that Jesus speaks more about finances and money in the Bible than we hear about heaven or hell combined. 
is because there's a really important piece of this in my life and in your life that matters. And so today's not a tithing sermon. I'm not going to tell you to break out your calendar and move your decimal point to find your 10% and all that stuff. I'm not going to do that today. It's not my heart. It's not my goal. And, And those of you that know my heart, if you're maybe new to real life church today, let me just tell you straight up, I don't need your money. Real life church depends on Christ. It always has. And we've been blessed because of that. And so if you feel led to give, then you give. If not, I'm not calling you and I'm not sending you a statement. I'm not sending you tithing envelopes to your house. We're just going to trust God because he's been faithful for the last 10 years at Real Life Church. Amen? Amen. And uh, we, we are a giving church. For those of you that know, you know. But if you don't know, we give away typically about 17% of our annual budget goes outside these walls to churches being planted, missions being started, uh, southern Mexico missions, churches in everywhere from Africa to India to Saipan to the Philippines. But we also plant churches in Florida and Nashville and Oklahoma and Detroit, Michigan, and anywhere the gospel needs to be preached, we support that. But then we also support right here in our backyard. And we support Care Center Ministries and other ministries that are doing great work to reach the community and do what they do. So we're a giving church. We love to do that. It's just part of our makeup. It always has been part of our makeup. So when I talk about finances, people are like, well, he's going to talk about generosity. Not today. Not today. We're just going to cut it up today. How many of you came hungry to church? Say amen. Yeah, Yeah, buddy. All right. Thank you to whoever cleaned my spatula because it didn't get cleaned second service. So. So in a month, here's the American reality that most Americans spend 125% of their monthly income. Now, think through that just for a second, because it shouldn't take long to figure out that you can't spend, well, you're not supposed to be able to spend 125% of what you bring in a month. But if we're talking about what we do each month, how many of you pay rent or have a mortgage? Say amen. Amen. How many of you wish you didn't? Say amen. amen. Okay, I understand that. But the reality is most of us do. We have something along those lines. So who wants the mortgage cake right here? You want the mortgage cake or are you going to hand it out? All right, Olivia, these, these guys are going to help me hand this out. So Olivia is going to hand out the mortgage cake. Who wants the mortgage cake? Somebody take it. I'll get hands everywhere. I'm just going to let you all know why it is in this service. So if there's any cake available, he's going to have his hand raised. So just let him have one. That's a pretty good sized piece. So, all right, so if you got a mortgage or you got rent, then you most definitely have utilities. How many of you have been enjoying that gas bill over the last several months? Hasn't that been a blessing from the Lord? I have talked to I have talked to my kids about grabbing the thermostat. Anybody have those kids in their house? I'll break your fingers in Jesus' name. (laughs) You touch that thermostat. But you got utility, you got gas, you got electric. Just so you guys know, and we'll get to this in just a second, um, part of utilities does not include internet. We'll get there. But that's not a utility. That's not a necessity to make your house work. You said it's a necessity to keep me sane. It might be, but some of y'all may do good not having Facebook right at your fingertips. Okay? So you have this. You got that taken out. Then, man, this has been great, right? Over the last couple months, we've been seeing. How many of you have to put fuel in your vehicle? Yeah, I'm going to need a bigger slice. (laughs) Now, we'll, we'll stay right there. Okay? Got fuel in that vehicle, man, you got to put gas in it, you got to, got to change oil in it, but fuel, man, before you sit down or before you get this cake finished, I may have to give you another slice of cake because the prices are changing so fast on fuel. It just keeps, it just continues to change. I seen a guy the other day, I stopped at a gas station to get put gas in my truck, and um, yeah, hands up if you want cake, they'll bring it to you, all right? Okay, wait, you got to wait till I cut it, all right? <laughs> thought some of you were worshiping a second ago. You're waiting for cake. I stopped at Casey's and I jumped out of the truck. A person I do not know is like, how far is it going to go? 
Um, I, I don't know, sir. I don't, I don't know what you're talking about. <laughs> I didn't, I didn't know if Casey's quit serving pizza. I, don't know, I didn't know what happened, but he was like, I don't know how far it's going to go. And I'm like, I don't know how far it's going to go either. What are we talking about? He said, these gas prices. And I'm like, oh, oh, okay. Yeah, I don't know how far it's going to go, but I don't know how many of you this week when you got to the gas pump, you were like, Jesus, thank you for this vehicle that I have to drive. Thank you for the availability of fuel that I just pulled up to. And if I didn't like it here, I could drive half a block and get to another one. Thank you, God, for the heater that's working in this car. How many of you did that? Or how many of you are like, dear Jesus, I'm going to kill somebody if these gas prices keep going up? (laughs) It's perspective, okay? Don't miss it. So not only that, how many of you got hobbies? Got any hobbies in the house? Some of you are like, whoo, I love to go play me some golf or Fishing, fishing, fishing's expensive. Golf is expensive. All you young people are like, I'm not, I'm too cool to play golf or go fishing. No, no, no. Your video games are 70 bucks a pop. Somebody needs this cake. I got hands over here. So I'll let I'll, you guys disperse. That way I don't feel like I'm singling anyone out. If my kids are raising their hands, do not give my children cake. <laughs> but... I'm just kidding. They're going to find a way to get cake. So they'll lie about being my kid to get cake. So so you got all these things that we go through just month to month, and we end up spending so much of it, and it goes fast because not only do you have that, how many of you have some debt? How many of you have college debt? Student loans. Anybody got student loans in the house? Yes, that's several right here. Let me, this is just for you because you need a break. Break. Just a, just a little bit of a breather, okay? And you guys paying for student loans, I'm appreciative. How many of you have, let's just have, let's have a little fun for us. How many of you have a student loan and you're absolutely using nothing that has to do with your degree that you're still paying on? <laughs> Same hands in the house, just went up. So, all right. It's a reality. It's a crazy world that we live in. That's something that's kind of new that's happening is we're seeing a huge shift in economics and we're seeing a huge shift in education and what it looks like. But it doesn't change the fact there's still debt there. Okay, let's have this party right now. This is going to be a good one. How many, let's, let's throw some credit card debt on the plate. Nobody wants to admit to this. They're like, keep your cake, Pastor Vince. <laughs> no, you all know. We know you got it. Same college kids raising their hand. Right there. <laughs> you got it? Yep. All right. So there's debt that happens. And credit card debt, people are like, well, you know, as soon as I graduated high school, my kids have moved out. And most of my kids moved out right at 18 years old. Not because I kicked them out, not because I wanted them out, but I just raised them independent. And so they leave. Braden turned 18 in March, and in August, he hit the road. He's traveling on the road, driving and working, and, and he's gone. Vanessa lives in Little Rock. My daughter Kaylee lives here in town. They're out, okay? But every day for my 23-year-old, 21-year-old, and 19-year-old, I get a credit card application in the mail. And I do my best to burn them before they come pick up their mail. I consider that junk mail. So, and so I just get rid of it because credit card debt's a real deal. The average American right now is pushing anywhere from eight to $15,000 in credit card debt. That goes into how you can spend 25% more than what you actually make. Okay? So you got credit card debt. How many of you, how many of you, just know, because you have kids, the kids are expensive. Okay. Okay. So, you got kids. You got kids, right? How, like, you have kids. Just, you just keep that, all right? <laughs> just, you just keep that. He's, he's not giving that up. He's got kids. Cody's got kids. So. But, but how many of you know this probably makes more sense? How many of you grew up when you five dollared your dad? Hey, Dad, can I borrow five dollars? If you were under the age of 30, put your hand down. You don't five dollar your dad, you're 20 dollar your dad. I know. I got 20 dollars, I'm going to the movies. I'm like, how many movies are you gonna see? 
Just one. Doesn't make sense to me, but the reality is there. So we've got this stuff, and then you just try to do the other stuff. If you if you got a gym membership, if you're trying to work out, as you get a huge slab of cake from your pastor. <laughs> okay? Just in, yeah, anybody, whoever wants it. You got these extra things that get tagged on, okay? Now here's what I'm going to do. Did you take two forks? No. Let's take two, because somebody's going to want to share that one. Okay? That's the gym one. They're going to feel guilty. So... And so you have all these things that come out every month, and then you end up, that's not enough, and so you spend more. And you spend more, and you spend more, and you try to split it up between a couple people, and before too long, the cake's gone. Do what? I forgot vehicle notes. I didn't put insurance on there either, did I? Food, groceries, man, how many of you spend more in groceries? Good Lord. It's crazy, isn't it? I want a chicken just so it'll produce for me because eggs are expensive. Mil- milk, I don't want to feed the chicken. I just want it to produce. Okay, I don't want to clean up after it. I, don't wanna, I just want a machine that shoots eggs out of it is really all I want. But, uh, you know, milk is expensive. Eggs are expensive. Meat is expensive unless you go get a cow slaughter. And even then, you got to buy a freezer if you're not prepared to hold a whole cow or half a beef or whatever it is that you need. And so it's all, it all just continually seems like it's going out. And our culture loves it because we buy into the fact that we need to be at a certain level. Like, like, we need to live at a certain level to be comfortable, Pastor Vince, because if not, then I don't know really if I'm comfortable. And man, we buy it. We buy it. Hook, line, sinker. Buy into this idea that we got to be here. You guys ever heard that phrase? Champagne taste? Beer budget? Yeah. Some of you are like, beer budget? I'm on Kool-Aid budget. <laughs> and tap water over here. That's what I'm running with. Water bill's high. I get it. And so you have these things, and, and society tells you, we've heard, I don't even know who the Joneses are, but I've heard my whole life about keeping up with them. You keep up with the Joneses, what does that mean? It means well, the, I, I will feel like, here's the, here's the lie. Here, listen, here's the lie the devil tells us. You will feel like you made it when you get to this level. Whatever that level is. Some of you are like, if I just had my car paid off, then I'd feel like I made it. If I just had my house paid off, then I'd feel like I made it. If I could just pay all my bills and have just a little bit of money left over, I'd feel like I made it. You know how long you would feel like you made it? Until you did it one time, and then you'd be like, well, I got some extra. Let me add this. Let me add that. I, don't, I mean, there's just two of us in the house, but I probably ought to get the biggest, fastest, meanest internet package there is. Because why not? I got to stream Netflix faster than everybody else, or I can't get my movie in time. Cell phone. It's a necessity, Pastor Vince. They still make landlines. Your cell phone's not a necessity. I get grief on that one a lot. A lot. Like you can get a landline like 20 bucks. Sometimes less than that. Sometimes they'll just throw it in because they don't even know what to do with them anymore. <laughs> just throw it in. But I got to have this. No, what you've done is you've convinced yourself to buy into culture's definition of what you need rather than what you need. I just got to go out to eat once a week. No, you don't. I seen a guy this week, I was watching diners, drive-ins, and whatever it is on Food Channel. Because I'm trying to eat better, so I just watch other people not eat better. <laughs> I'm living vicariously through their taste buds. <laughs> and I sat there and I watched a guy make a hamburger with a big old slab of bologna on it. And I'm like, I can eat that at home, like any time. And this guy's getting like 15 bucks a hamburger for it. I thought, I should start selling hamburgers is what I should start doing. But the reality is I, I didn't need it. I don't need it. Now, I like to. Now, here's the thing. I've never dealt with an addiction in regards to smoking, drinking, drugs, alcohol, anything like that. I've never really, I, I don't know that I could say I've ever been addicted. But I love me some food. Just being straight with you. Um, this is me confessing. 
Um, I love it. I don't eat, I, I just eat it because I like it. I like different kinds of food. I like going to places, restaurants I've never been. It's one of our r- travel rules. If we leave Mountain Home, we don't eat at a restaurant that Mountain Home has while we're gone. We just don't. Because we're going to try something different. Mom and pop, hole in the wall, chains, fancy steakhouse, you name it, I'll eat it. I don't need to. I, I could go to the grocery store and I can make better choices, but, but I don't because, see, I got to that level where I thought, well, this is good and I'm making it. How many of you right now, if you'd cut back on things that you want rather than what you need, your savings account would be fat? Yeah, especially over a couple years, right? So here's the problem. Worry is the problem. Worry is the problem because the system's broke. Here's why the system's broke. You and I are in the system. That's why it's broke. We are the weakest link. In, we are the weak, weakest gear in the system of finances and blessing in regards to God and resource. We know that God is the resource. But we know that God also blesses the things around us. We have a job, and that job provides us resource. But we are the weakest link in that because then we ultimately still get to choose what we do with, it, with our money. We ultimately still get to choose. And because culture has convinced us that everything that you need more, you got to have more, you got to go after more, you gotta, you got to seek after more, and, and once you finally get more, you'll be better, or you'll be fine, or you'll be satisfied, which is a lie because once you get to more, you only want more, and that's what we do. If you don't believe me, all you have to do is if you could go back 30 years, go back 20 years online and search McDonald's menu, okay? I haven't been to McDonald's in about two weeks, praise Jesus, okay? Yeah, I know. No, 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 no. Stop, don't clap like this is a victory. My heart breaks every time I, it's like seeing an old friend. A wave. And so, if you go back, you'll see, like, all we've done is ask for more. Like, remember at one time you have, used to have to ask to supersize it. Now everybody just assumes you're getting a large drink, because why wouldn't you? Why wouldn't you? I mean, medium drink's a dollar, the small drink's a dollar, and the big one's a dollar. Doesn't even make sense. What? Doesn't make sense. Why would I get the small one when I can get the big one for a dollar? Because you don't need the big one. But how many of us get the big one? Yeah, I'm not sweating you. I live it. If I turn to the side, you can see that I live it. (laughs) And so that mentality of desiring and seeking more in our life strangely only affects us when it's anything other than God. We want more money, we want more food, we want more supply, we want more resource, we want more house, we want more TV. How many of you had a perfectly good tube TV when flat screen TVs came out, but you got a flat screen because they were available? I know some of you held on. You were just like, no, I'm not doing it. Then you finally did, and you're like, why did I wait so long? But Parker, my son, is a gamer, and he, he... he likes to, he keeps trying to tell me, I'm like, you have a TV. He's like, that's not a monitor. And I'm like, can you see what it is you're playing on that thing? Yeah. Then you are monitoring what you're playing. <laughs> He's like, no, Dad, it's refresh rates. And it's, he starts running through this long list of things that I love my son and I care deeply about him, but I don't, I don't understand and I don't know that I, I'm not losing sleep over refresh rates. Not doing it, okay? But see, it's valuable to him. It's not valuable to me, so it's different for us. What the world has convinced us of is there are certain things that are valuable, and what that is is more. More, you know? Every two years, they come up with it. Like I said about the video games, it's so funny. People go out there and spend $70 on a video game, and two years later, they're going to change the entire system. Guess what? To get you to spend more money on video games. The fact is, some of you have the same video game for four different systems of game, because the, the console upgraded and you had to get the game to upgrade with the console and so you just kept buying the same game. You bought the same game four times. It's like a buy here, pay here place and you fell into prison. <laughs> you keep buying the same. I had a guy one time, I used to sell cars and we had a guy that had a, 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 a buy here, pay here place and he was like, that's the Golden Tornado. And I'm like, the Golden Tornado? And he was like, yeah, it's a Ford Tornado. And I'm like, yeah, that's great. He said, I've sold that thing 14 times. It's awesome. 
I'm like, what is the idea? People come in, they just get it, and they keep going, they keep getting Here's the reality. I, when I sold cars, I, and I'm, I promise I'm going to get to Scripture. If you're like, what is this place? I have a Bible verse. When I sold cars, it was always crazy because we could walk people, I would walk people down the line. And they would always come in, and they're going to out-negotiate the salesman because that's what people think they can do. And what you don't understand is salesmen spend their entire careers learning what you're going to say. And so you start walking down the line with them. I don't want, I don't want you no messing around. You give me that bottom dollar price, and I, don't, I just need to get from point A to point B. There you go. Rubber floor mats, five-speed transmission, no power windows, no power locks, no air conditioning, AM radio. Do you want me to write it up? They go, well, no, wait, now, hold, hold on. Oh, what? what? You, don't, this, you just said point A to point B. This is point A to point B. No, no, no. What, I mean, my wife's going to be in the car a little bit. <laughs> so I'm going to need some air conditioning. Oh, well, let's walk this way then. Air conditioning, yeah, I mean, how much more really is power windows? Power windows for you actually means you're going to have to sacrifice two Cokes a week, sir. You sacrifice two Cokes at McDonald's a week, and I can get you power windows, power locks in that vehicle right now. Oh, really? Yeah, that's exactly what I can do. So now I'm four cars up, and this guy's not buying anything that he needs. He's buying everything that he wants. We're going to back this up in Scripture and go to Matthew chapter 6. And what we're going to read is not a money scripture as much as it is a heart scripture. And I want you to hear what Jesus has to say about this. He says in Matthew chapter 6, verse 25, Therefore I tell you, do not be anxious about your life. Do you hear the command in this verse? There, there's, not, there's not an option. There's not a work on not being anxious in your life. No, no. Do not be anxious about your life, what you will eat or what you will drink, nor about your body. What you will put on is not life more than food and the body more than clothing. Verse 26, look at the birds of the air. They neither sow nor reap nor gather into barns, and yet your heavenly Father feeds them. Are you not more valuable than them? How many of you understand that you are more valuable to God? than the birds of the field, birds of the air and the beasts of the field. If you question that, I know some of you love your dogs, but let me just set you straight on this biblically. Jesus Christ died for you. He didn't die for the animals. Okay? Oh, I talked a lot, didn't I? <laughs> you, just, you just hang out back there with me, Isaac, for a little while, all right? So he gets into this, he keeps going. And which of you, verse, 20, verse 27 needs to be somebody in this room's life verse. You need to write it down, put it on a post-it note, stick it on your bathroom mirror, stick it on your steering wheel, stick it on your desk at work, stick it on your spouse's forehead. You need to own this verse, verse 27. And which of you, by being anxious, can add a single hour to your lifespan? How many of you spend time worrying about stuff that you can't fix anyway? You got no control over. And it's okay. I get it, but that's not how God intended you to live. That's not God's hope or expectation for you. He has more planned for you. He said, consider, or, and why are you, excuse me, and why are you anxious about clothing? Consider the lilies of the field and how they grow. They're neither, they neither toil nor spin. I tell you, even Solomon in all his glory was not arrayed like one of these. But if God clothes the grass of the field, which today is alive and tomorrow is thrown in the oven, will he not much more clothe you? O oh, you of little faith! Therefore, do not be anxious, saying, What shall we eat, or what shall we drink, or what shall we wear? For the Gentiles seek after these things, and your heavenly Father knows that you need them all. Did you hear that? He knows what you need. But seek first the kingdom of God, and his righteousness, and all of these things, all these things that you worried about, the food, your drink, your clothes, the, thing, the necessities, all those things you worry about. He's got you. He's got you, but he's got to be first. It's a priority thing. It's the reason worry pops up. It's the reason anxiety and insecurity pops up. It's because of a, 
placement in our faith. So insecurity comes into finances because we keep wanting to keep up with the Joneses. And here's the trick of the enemy. The trick of the enemy says, here's the deal. I'm going to have you worry so much about getting more and getting more until you finally reach the place where you feel like you've got enough. And then I'm going to flip it over on your head. And what do you mean by that, Pastor Vince? I mean, once you get there, then you start worrying about how do you maintain it? How do you keep paying the bills? How do you keep this car? How do you keep this house? How do you keep the kids in the right clothes and the right shoes and the right this and the right that? How do I make sure that my wife feels this? And how do I make sure my husband has all that he wants to do? Because now he wants to hunt instead of fish. And now instead of one, he wants to drive a NASCAR. And I don't want, his hobbies are so expensive. But now i got to try to figure out how to keep up with all of that. And so the enemy's got you coming both ways. He's got you stressed out about building it. And then he's got you stressed out about maintaining it. And you live this life out from beginning to end, worried and freaking out about things God never intended you to worry about because he said, if you'll do what you can do and trust me with the rest, I got you. I ran into a gentleman the other day. He was here in town. He owns a restaurant here in town. Uh, MH Burgers. Love those things. Man, smash sauce. But I pulled up several weeks back. We were talking. I said, man, you are killing it. He's like, yeah, it's been really good. I'm like, so what's next? You going to put one on the other end of town? You going to open a storefront? Get some tables out here? What are you thinking? What's next? See what happened in my mind? My logical mind said, you are succeeding. Go get more. You are succeeding. Go get more. That's what we do, right? We succeed and then we get more. We succeed and then we get more. And if, that, if somebody somehow stops in the middle, we're like, what are you doing? What are you doing? Why would you stop in the middle? And so I asked him, I'm like, is that the plan? He just started laughing. He said, bro, he said, God is just wearing me out right now. He's been so good to me. I don't need anything else from him. And it was like the Holy Spirit himself punched me right in the face. I drove off. I was like the rich young ruler that says when Jesus confronted him, he walked away sad. I drove away from the burger place disappointed in myself. I was like, man, how did I miss that? And then we sing the song this morning, and I don't know what they're going to sing week to week. I don't find out until I get here Sunday morning just like you do. And this morning they sing the song, I'm sorry for just going through the motions. I'm sorry for when I forgot that you were enough. And we live there, church. Our culture has convinced us to live in this cyclical insecurity of worry, doubt, worry, doubt, worry, doubt, worry, doubt. And then when we worry we can't afford it, we go get a credit card or we go get a loan. And guess what? We just piled on to worry and doubt because now we got to afford to make that minimum payment or that 29.99% is going to kick in at the end of the month. And then what? Well, then we don't care. And so society and culture says, well, what you do is because nobody cares about this stuff, really, you just go file bankruptcy. But guess what? Then you're still buried under debt. You're still buried under the reality that it's there. And you're not owning the reality that there is a God who said, hey, I'm taking care of the birds of the field and I love you way more than that if you'll trust me. I'm clothing the lilies of the field and you are much more beautiful than that. You are fearfully and wonderfully made in the image and likeness of God. I got you. But we bought into worry and insecurity. So events, what's the opposite? This is where our culture's at. What's the opposite? The opposite's one word that nobody likes to talk about, and that's stewardship. You just got to manage it, right? You got to plan it better. Greatest advice I've ever been given as a leader and a pastor is when I just started, and a guy come and told me, he said, I'm going to give you a couple sentences that hopefully it'll help you because I know you're not real organized. And I said, thank you. He said, but I want you to hear this. I said, okay, what do you got? He said, plan your work, work your plan. Plan your work, work your plan. And that just stuck with me. I hope you all know that every one of you that are here this morning, we planned on you being here. We planned on it. 
Floors were clean, chairs were set in place, coffee's out, the right creamer, the ones you like, we put them out there so you get that little sugar jolt so you don't fall asleep while I'm preaching. We, we put them out there, the ice water is where it is. We only do one jug of unsweet tea because no one really drinks that stuff anyway. Two jugs of sweet tea because we know you're coming. Clear the parking lots when it snows or ice. We, got, we know you're coming. We made plans for you to be here. And on Sundays, we work out that plan. But we do that in a lot of other places, but we won't do it in regards to God. We won't do it in regards to our finances. And we wonder why we struggle. Guys, if you want a deeper relationship with God, plan your work. When are you going to sit down and have prayer? When are you going to sit down and study your Bible? When are you going to sit down and witness to somebody? When are you going to plan it, put it on a calendar, and then go work that plan? I get some of your finances right now. I don't even have to guess in this room this side. There are people in here right now that the biggest thing on your mind is the train wreck, which is your finances. I had a conversation with one of our fellows that's staying at the shelter next door, and he wrote me this beautiful letter about homelessness from the perspective of the homeless. He said, I just thought it might interest you. And I read that thing, and he said, what America doesn't realize is that the majority of them are two missed paychecks and a major medical incident away from being right where we are. It's that close because we're not working any kind of plan. We're just getting by. We're getting through this one to the next one to the next one to the next one. We'll make sure it works out. But if something tragic happened, and guys, we've had them next door from 19 to 82. I don't know all their stories. He said, it's not because we're all strung out on drugs or seeking the next high. He said, some of us, our wives died and we didn't know what to do. And so we live in the only thing that we have left, which is a van. And when you open up, we come in and get warm and get a warm meal. That's what we do. See that, quit working a plan. It's been so awesome to be able to start giving some plans over there. But in your life, do you have a plan? You see, because God, the culture's way that we live in is you don't have to plan, you just have to go more in debt. You don't have to have a plan, you just got to qualify for the next card. As long as you qualify for the next card, then you'll be fine. Because then you can actually take and you can, you can start kiting and you start paying this one off with that one and that one off with this one. You don't have to pay anything. It's great. It's also illegal. You go to prison. Don't do that. But what's your plan? That's, that's their plan. That's the world's plan. And let me tell you this real quick before, and, and just I'm going to tell you this at the end, so if you get offended, you can go home and be mad at me. No one in the world, young people, I pray you're listening to me. No one in the world owes you anything. Older people, more mature people, I'll say it that way, Make sure that when you amen that, you don't amen it from a place of pride like you got it together. Because you've made some mistakes too along the way. You're not owed anything. Well, I deserve this. I don't even know where that word come from in regards to work. Uh, you deserve whatever the boss pays you. They're the boss. It's their business. Well, but I feel that's where we start getting in trouble. The feelings just get you in trouble. Can I get an amen? amen. Any of y'all ever said anything silly out of feelings to your kids? I'll beat you. Uh, uh, yeah. You're not owed anything. If you're not owed anything, here's, and here's the thing. If you're sitting there and you're going, actually, I don't agree with you, Pastor Vince. I do believe I'm owed something. Let me clear this up for you. If you were owed something by the world, let me ask you one question. Why would you ever want to be in debt to the world when the one who paid all your debts is telling you there's a better plan? Why would you want to be in debt to the world? All their goal is is to hold you down, keep you down, press you down. That's it, because they don't want you living in freedom, because when you live in freedom, people watch you. They're watching you live in freedom. 
And they go, whatever they got, I want. And you get to tell them, no, no, see, one paid my debt and set me free. And yeah, it took me a while, but I got the financial stuff figured out. Yeah, it took me a while, but I got the relationship figured out. Yeah, it took me a while, but I got the job thing figured out. I didn't expect everybody to just hand it to me. I had to go get it. Had to go work. I had to use what God had blessed me with in regards to health and opportunity. Somebody asked me a few weeks ago, and I'm going to close, I promise. I said, hey, I just wish God would bless me with money. I said, God doesn't bless people with money. God blesses people with opportunity. Money comes after that. I said, but a lot of it depends on what you do with the opportunity. You know, he owns the cattle on a thousand hills, so he could drop a beef on your porch if he wanted to. That's not how he functions. No, these things that you have seen in me and heard in me, this is the Apostle Paul, these things that you have seen in me and heard in me and watched me do, do them, and then the God of peace will be upon you. Go get it. Don't live in the culture society of debt and death. Live in Christ's society of generosity and trust. Insecurity versus security. If you look at this scripture, I'm going to close right here in John chapter 10, verse 9 and 10. John chapter 10, verse 9 says, I am the door. If anyone enters by me, he will be saved and will go in and out and find what? Church, say it loud. Pasture. You know what pasture is? Pasture is safety. Pasture is security. The world wants you to live in insecurity. God said, no, no, no. I'm the door. If you'll come in through me, I can show you how to be secure in me, safe in me, understanding that there's not going to be things that get you in here with me. Yeah, you're going to have to work a plan. Yeah, you're going to have to make a plan. But I promise if you're in the pasture of Christ, you're all right. But here, he's even better than just giving you a safe place. Verse 10 goes on to say this. After verse 9, he says, you'll be in pasture. But the thief comes only to steal, to kill, and destroy. I came that they would have life and have it how, church? That's supply. So God not only wants to give you security and safety, but he wants to give you supply while you're there. Why would you trust any other plan but that? We'll talk about that next week. Because there's a reason we don't trust his plan. And it's not going to be an easy one to swallow. It's not for me. I want you to go and I want you to celebrate all the things. I want you to, at the week, this week, when somebody mentions gas prices, tell them how thankful you are for your car. Straight up. Say, look, I know it doesn't make any sense and the world's a mess and we could argue politics for the next hour or I could just tell you that, man, I'm so thankful God's given me a vehicle and the funds to put gas in it. Praise Jesus. And move on. Move on trusting God with the plan in your life and then living it out that way. And listen, if you're here this morning, you say, Pastor Vince, my, my stuff is a wreck. We have mentors in the church, financial mentors, that are willing to just sit with you. Just walk and help you try to figure some stuff out. We have classes at the Reach Center that do this. But we have individuals that have even said, hey, I've been through this. I've walked through it in my life. I know what this is like to just get sideways and not see the end of it in sight. But God is good. And so we've got resources for you. You don't have to stay there. You don't have to stay there. 